Okay, in this lecture we're going to cover our section 12.6 material on curve sketching. Uh, so in our previous sections from chapter 12, uh, we've seen how the first and second derivatives of a function can tell us about uh, the graph of a function. Uh, in particular, the first derivative uh, can be used to tell us where a function is increasing or decreasing and identify its local extrema. Uh, and the second derivative can be used to determine where uh, the graph of a function is concave upward or downward and where it has inflection points. Um, so that information is typically helpful if we're trying to sketch the graph of a function uh, and we don't have um, graphing utilities readily available, uh, like a graphing calculator or uh, software. Um, so in this section, we'll consider how to sketch the graph of a function by hand using this information. Uh, and then I'll also show you how to use um, some free uh, software online to generate the graphs of functions uh, so that you can kind of check your work uh, for these problems. So uh, let's describe the outline for this curve sketching procedure. Um, so in general, if we're trying to sketch the graph of some function, y equals f of x, uh, we'll go through the following steps. So our first step uh, would be to find the y-intercept, if it exists, uh, by setting x equal to 0, and then computing the y-value uh, when x is 0, that is f of 0. Now our second step would be to find the x-intercepts, uh, if there are any, by setting y equal to zero and solving the equation f of x equals to zero, if doing so is not too difficult. Uh, now our third step is if the function f is a rational function, that is a quotient of two polynomials, then we would try to find any vertical asymptotes uh, by finding the numbers for which the denominator is zero, but the numerator is non-zero. Uh, and then we would try to find any horizontal asymptotes by considering the limit of our function as x approaches either positive or negative infinity. Now in our fourth step, uh, we would find the first and the second derivatives, which are going to tell us uh, about the intervals on which a, a function is increasing or decreasing and the concavity. Um, and in order to determine where a function is increasing or decreasing, we would first locate any critical values uh, by setting the derivative f prime of x equal to zero uh, and determining maybe values where the derivative does not exist but the function is defined. Then using that information, we can find the intervals where the function f of x is increasing or decreasing uh, by looking at the sign of the first derivative uh, on the intervals determined by our critical values. Then in our next step, uh, we would find the local extrema by making use of the first or the second derivative test. Uh, so if we know where a function is increasing or decreasing from the previous step, uh, then we know it's easy to determine where a function has its local extrema. Uh, now our next step would be to locate potential inflection points uh, by solving the equation f double prime of x is equal to zero, uh, or determining where the second derivative does not exist, but the function f of x does. And then we can find uh, the intervals on which the function is concave upward or downward by looking at the sign of the second derivative on uh, each interval determined by uh, the values of x uh, for which the second derivative was zero or undefined. And once we know the intervals of concavity, we can use that information to determine any inflection points. Again, those are points uh, where we change concavity and our function is defined. Um, now, uh, in our 10th step, we would use the results that we found in our preceding steps, along with any other information that might be available uh, to determine the general shape of the graph of our function. Then we will plot the intercepts, our critical points, and our points of inflection, uh, and any other points possibly as needed. And then we will connect these points uh, with a smooth curve uh, 
uh, making sure that we use the correct concavity and being careful not to draw a connected graph uh, through any points where our function is undefined, such as uh, maybe a vertical asymptotes. And then uh, in our last step, we say if feasible, we would verify our results by making use of a graphing calculator or computer, uh, which I'll show you how to do in this lecture. Uh, and if there are any significant differences between our graph and the calculators, uh, then we would check for mistakes in our hand-drawn graph um, or possibly uh, adjust our viewing window um, if we need to uh, look at our graph in a little um, larger window or if we need to zoom in on any particular part of our graph. Uh, so let's look at some examples that are going to outline this procedure. Um, so in our first example, we have the function f of x, which is this third degree polynomial. And in part A of this problem, we're supposed to determine the intervals on which f is increasing or decreasing. So as we've seen in our earlier chapter 12 material, uh, to determine where a function is increasing or decreasing, we first need to find the critical values of our function by finding the first derivative. So here, uh, our first derivative, f prime of x, is equal to 6x squared minus 24. And this derivative is defined for all values of x. Uh, so the only critical values we would have are values for which this derivative is 0. So to solve for x, uh, we could divide both sides of this equation by 6, and we would have x squared minus 4 is equal to 0. Uh, so x squared is equal to 4. And so taking the square root, x would be positive or negative 2. So we have these critical values. Uh, now let's determine where our function is increasing or decreasing. So the domain of our function, which is a polynomial, is all real numbers. So we have the entire real line. And then we had critical values at positive 2 and negative 2. So we need to determine the sign of the derivative in each of these subintervals. Um, so we can choose test values in each interval uh, to substitute into our derivative. So uh, let's start on the far left end, uh, choosing a number less than negative 2. Uh, we could maybe use negative 3 and then substituting negative 3 into our derivative, f prime of x, uh, we see that we would have a positive value. So our function would be increasing on that interval. Uh, now between negative 2 and positive 2, uh, we could choose 0 for x as a test value, and substituting 0 into the first derivative, we have negative 24, which means that our function is decreasing on that interval. And then to the right of 2, we could take a positive 3, substituting into our derivative. Again, we have a positive value, so our function is increasing on that interval. Um, so summarizing our results, uh, we could say that this function would be increasing on the intervals from negative infinity to negative 2, or uh, from 2 to infinity and this function is decreasing on the interval from negative 2 to positive 2. Now once we have our results from part A, uh, in part B we're asked to find the local extrema of our function, uh, and we can identify our local extrema using the first derivative test if we just look at our results in uh, part A. Um, so we saw that uh, our function changed from increasing to decreasing at negative 2. So the first derivative test says that we have a local maximum at x equals negative 2. And to get the y-coordinate for this point, we would take x equals negative 2 and substitute back into our original function because we're looking at the graph of y equals f of x. So to get our y-coordinate, we take the x value and plug into our function. 
Uh, so here, substituting negative 2 into the original function, uh, we get a value of positive 30. Uh, now, we also saw from part A that our function changed from decreasing to increasing at positive 2. Uh, so by the first derivative test, we have a local minimum at x equals positive 2. And again, to find the y-coordinate for this point, uh, we would substitute x equals 2 into the original function, and we obtain a value of negative 34. So the local extrema can be identified directly from uh, the intervals on which our function is increasing or decreasing. Uh, so in part C, we're then asked to find the intervals on which f is concave upward or downward and identify the inflection points. Uh, so for concavity, we need to look at the second derivative. So we start by taking our second derivative, f double prime of x, uh, which here is equal to 12x. Uh, and we see where this function is either 0 or undefined. Um, now it's defined everywhere. Um, so setting the second derivative equal to 0, uh, we find that x would equal to 0. And so if we consider the domain of our function, again, all real numbers, so we have the entire real line for our variable x, uh, and we had a value of 0, uh, which made the second derivative 0. So for a concavity, we need to determine the sign of the second derivative on each of these subintervals. Um, so choosing a value of x uh, to the left of 0, say negative 1 or any negative number, uh, if we substitute that value into our second derivative, which was 12x, uh, we get a negative value. Uh, which means that our function is concave downward on this interval. And choosing a value of x uh, to the right of 0, say x equals 1, and substituting into the second derivative, we would have a positive value, so our function is concave upward on that interval. So summarizing our results, uh, we can say that this uh, function is uh, concave upward, on the interval from 0 to positive infinity. It is concave downward on the interval from negative infinity to 0. And then uh, the point where we changed concavity uh, would be our inflection point. So here for our inflection point, uh, well, we changed concavity at x equal to 0, and to get the y-coordinate for this point, uh, we take x equals 0, and we substitute it back into the original function, uh, which gives us a value of negative 2. Um, so now that we have this information, in the last part of this problem, uh, we're supposed to sketch the graph of our function. Um, so here, let's start by making a rough sketch by hand, and then we'll sort of verify our results by using some software. Um, so here in the xy plane, we want to sketch the graph of our function. Uh, now usually the way that I like to do this, um, as indicated in our little outline, uh, is to um, sketch the intercepts of our function. Uh, now for this function, it's not very easy to find your x-intercepts by hand. Uh, the y-intercept we've already found in part c uh, was the point 0, negative 2. That was our uh, inflection point that we found. Uh, and then I would also plot the local extrema. Um, so in part b, we found our function had a local maximum at the point negative 2, uh, 30. So it won't be drawn to scale here, but... Uh, we go two units to the right, 30 units upward, and we had a local minimum at positive 2, uh, negative 34. So our, again, not drawn to scale here, but our uh, local minimum value uh, would be negative 34. And now I'm going to try to uh, connect these points uh, by smooth 
uh, curves, uh, uh, noting the information about where our function is increasing or decreasing and concave upward or downward. Um, so here uh, in part A, we had seen that our function was increasing on the interval from negative infinity to negative two. Um, so I have a, a function uh, which will be increasing on that interval. And I also know from part C uh, that my graph is concave downward everywhere from negative infinity to zero. So from negative infinity up to this negative two value, I will have a curve which is increasing and in concave downward. So rough sketch, it looks something like this. And then we have our local maximum at negative 230. Uh, now from negative 2 until 0, uh, x equals 0, uh, we have a function which is still concave downward, uh, but is now decreasing. Um, so our function was decreasing on the interval from negative 2 to positive 2. So our function is still concave downward. And now it's decreasing. And we, we know that we're passing through this inflection point at 0, negative 2. Now, once we hit this inflection point, our concavity is going to change. Um, so our function we know is concave upward from 0 to infinity and is still decreasing uh, until we reach positive 2. So here I will change the shape of my curve to be concave upward, but still decreasing. And we have this local minimum at 2, negative 34. Uh, now, once we pass 2 uh, for values of x greater than 2, our function is again increasing and uh, it is still concave upward on the interval from zero to infinity. So for the last part of our curve, we still have a concave upward uh, function, uh, which is increasing. Um, so we would have a curve that looks something like this, y equals f of x. Uh, now, in order to verify our results, uh, we could make use of uh, some graphing software. Um, so if you have a graphing calculator uh, or some software that you prefer, of course, you can use that. Um, in, in this lecture, I'm going to show you a, a free graphing utility um, uh, sponsored or hosted by Desmos. So to access this, um, if you just go to whatever your favorite search engine is, uh, search Desmos graphing calculator, uh, it should be the first link that pops up. Um, so if you follow this link, then uh, you arrive at this graphing utility. It might look slightly different if you're on um, an iPad or uh, your smartphone, um, or if you're using a, a, a PC. Um, but in general, uh, the way that this graph works is uh, you are going to input uh, in this top left corner the uh, function that you're trying to graph. Uh, and for our example, we had the function um, for x, and then uh, in our little lower left-hand corner, we have this a to the b expression, so we're going to raise this to the third power. And then we were subtracting 24 times x, uh, and then we were subtracting 2 from that value. Um, so you can see, of course, as you're inputting your curve, the uh, uh, sketch updates automatically. Um, so taking a look at our sketch here, it looks pretty similar to what we did by hand. Let me zoom out a little bit. Uh, and we can see here that we do indeed have uh, an inflection point, uh, also our y-intercept at 0, negative 2. Uh, it looks like our uh, local um, maximum, uh, or let's see, do I have the correct function here? Let me go back to, it was uh, 2x cubed was that first term. Um, so let me go back to uh, adjust this. So here, that first term should have been a 2x cubed. Uh, 
Okay, um, so now we can see uh, on our curve this uh, local maximum appears to be at uh, negative 230. Our local minimum uh, was at positive 2, negative 34. Uh, and we see uh, the sketch of our uh, curve was um, not completely precise uh, as, as we could get by using software, but uh, did capture the essential information about our function where it's increasing or decreasing in its concavity. Um, so let's look at some other examples. Um, so for our next one, again, we have a polynomial function, this time fourth degree. And again, in part A, we're asked to determine the intervals on which this function is increasing or decreasing. So we start by looking for critical values. Those are values where the derivative, which is 4x cubed, minus 4x is either undefined, uh, and in this case it's defined everywhere, or uh, where this derivative is equal to zero. So to solve for x here, well we can factor out a 4x from each term, and we're left with an x squared minus 1 is equal to zero. Uh, so we have either x is equal to zero, or x squared minus 1 is 0, in which case x could be positive or negative 1. Um, so to determine the intervals for increase or decrease, we would consider the domain of our function, which is all real numbers since it's a polynomial, and we had critical values at 0, negative 1, and positive 1. Um, so to determine our intervals of increase or decrease, uh, we need to find the sign of the derivative in each of these subintervals. Um, so moving from left to right, uh, to the left of negative 1, uh, we could use a test value of maybe negative 2, and substituting into our first derivative, we would have a uh, negative 8 times a positive number. Uh, which is negative. So that means our function is decreasing on this interval. Uh, between negative 1 and 0, we could use maybe negative 1 half. Uh, substituting into our first derivative, we get a positive value. Between 0 and 1, uh, we could use a value of 1 half. Uh, and we see that our derivative would be negative. Uh, and then to the right of 1, we could use a, t a test value of, say, 2. Uh, substituting into the derivative, we get a positive value, which means our function is increasing there. Um, so to summarize our results, uh, we could say that our function would be increasing on the intervals negative 1 to 0 or from 1 to infinity and is decreasing on the interval uh, negative infinity to negative 1 or from 0 to 1. Uh, now in part b, once we have our information about where the function is increasing or decreasing, uh, we're asked to find the local extrema of this function. Um, so using the first derivative test, uh, we can see in uh, part a, uh, our function changed from increasing to decreasing at x equals 0, which means that we have a local maximum at x equals 0. Uh, now to get the y-coordinate for that local maximum, or the local maximum value, uh, we would take x equals 0 and substitute into our original function. And we see our value would be 3. Uh, now, in part A, we also saw that our function uh, was changing from uh, decreasing to increasing at x equals positive 1 and negative 1. Uh, and here, regardless of whether you take positive or negative 1 for x, you'll get the same y value from your function, uh, which would be 2. Um, so here we have the following local extrema for our function. Uh, now, in part C, again, we're asked for the intervals of concavity and inflection points. So we'll start by taking our second derivative, that is f double prime of x, uh, which is 
12x squared minus 4. We set that equal to 0. Uh, and to solve for x, we could start by dividing through by 4. Uh, so we have 3x squared minus 1 is 0. Uh, so then x squared would be 1 third. And taking the square root of both sides, x could be positive or negative uh, square root of 1 third. So that's the same as the square root of 1 divided by the square root of 3. So plus or minus 1 over the square root of 3. Um, so now, uh, to determine concavity, we would look at the domain of our function. Again, all real numbers. And we had values of x, uh, which were negative 1 over root 3, or positive 1 over root 3, where our second derivative was 0. So to determine concavity, I would choose test values in each of these subintervals and look at the sign of the second derivative. So to the left of uh, negative 1 over root 3, I could use negative 1. And substituting into our second derivative, uh, we see that we would have a positive value. So our function will be concave upward on that interval. Uh, between positive and negative, 1 over root 3, we could take 0. And we see that our second derivative would be negative at x equals 0. So our function is concave downward. And then to the right of positive 1 over root 3, we could take positive 1. And we see that our second derivative would be positive. Um, so summarizing our results, uh, we could say that this function is concave upward on the intervals from negative infinity to negative 1 over root 3, uh, or from positive 1 over root 3 to infinity, and is concave downward on the interval from negative 1 over the square root of 3 to positive 1 over root 3, and so our inflection points would occur at x equals positive or negative 1 over root 3. And uh, for either the positive or negative value, uh, we have the same y-coordinate in this case, uh, which is 22 over 9. Uh, you can find that by taking x equals positive or negative 1 over the square root of 3, and substituting into the original function. Um, so this value 22 over 9 is um, uh, 2.4 repeating, um, so about 2.5, a little bit less. Um, so once we have this information, we can then uh, sketch the graph of our function. Um, so as we did in our last example, uh, let's consider for points in the xy plane what our graph looks like. Um, so again, I would start by sketching my inflection points, uh, the uh, local extrema, um, which here also uh, illustrates the y-intercept. Uh, the x-intercepts aren't very easy to solve uh, for in this example. Um, so we'll stick with just the y-intercept. So we saw uh, we had a local maximum of 0, 3, uh, which is also our y-intercept. Um, and then we had a local minimum at positive or negative 1, uh, 2. So if we move one unit to the left or the right, uh, two units upward, we would have the following. Uh, local minima. And then we had inflection points at uh, positive or negative um, 1 over root 3. Uh, so that lies uh, between 0 and negative 1 or 0 and positive 1 uh, with a y value of 22 ninths was about 2.4. Um, so here our inflection points just a rough sketch. We've got uh, points in here somewhere. Okay, um, so let's consider connecting uh, these points by some smooth curve, uh, which has the indicated um, a direction of concavity uh, and increase or decrease.
So we saw from part A uh, that our function was decreasing from negative infinity to negative 1 and was concave upward from negative infinity uh, to negative 1 over root 3. So we have some function which is decreasing and concave upward. So it looks something like this uh, until we have our local minimum at uh, negative 1, 2. Uh, at which point between negative 1 and 0, our function begins increasing, and it's still concave upward until we hit that inflection point, at which uh, point we change the direction of concavity to be concave downward, but still uh, increasing until we hit our local maximum of 0, 3, uh, at which point our function again becomes decreasing, or it's still uh, concave downward, but is now decreasing until we hit that inflection point, uh, at which point it's still decreasing, but is now concave upward. So something like this until we hit that local uh, minimum at 1, 2, and then it becomes increasing and still concave upward uh, from 1 to infinity. So rough sketch, we have a graph of our function that looks something like this. And uh, to verify this, um, let's take a look at our software. So here we had x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 3 as our function. So going back to our software, we can delete the function that we had in the previous example. And here we are graphing x raised to the fourth power uh, minus 2 times x squared plus 3. Um, so here we see our uh, software gives us the graph of our function. We can, of course, zoom in. Uh, and we see that we do have a y-intercept, which is also a local maximum at 0, 3. Uh, we have our local minima at um, negative 1, 2 or positive 1, 2 uh, with the indicated directions of increase or decrease and concavity. It looks pretty similar uh, to the graph that we sketched by hand. All right. So let's look at some other ones. Uh, in these next examples, we'll consider the uh, case of a rational function, say the quotient of two polynomials. Um, so these uh, examples are a little more involved because we'll also be considering uh, whether our function has vertical or horizontal asymptotes. Um, so for this example, we have f of x is x squared divided by x squared minus 1, and we're supposed to find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes of f. Um, so let's start by considering vertical asymptotes. Uh, so recall that a vertical asymptote uh, would be a point for, or, or a, a value for which our function is undefined. Um, so we have our function approaching positive or negative infinity as we would approach this value. Uh, so to identify vertical asymptotes, we're looking for values of x for which the denominator is equal to zero but the numerator is non-zero. Um, so to find our vertical asymptotes, we would start by setting our denominator, x squared minus 1 equal to 0, uh, which means that x squared is 1, so x is positive or negative 1. Um, so here we could say that we have vertical asymptotes of x equals plus uh, 1 or x equals negative 1. Um, and we can verify this if we were to consider the limiting values as x approaches positive or negative 1 uh, from the left or the right. Um, so here, the limit of our function x squared over x squared minus 1 as x approaches 1 uh, from the left is uh, negative infinity the limit as x approaches 1 from the right is equal to positive infinity. Uh, similarly, the limit as x approaches negative 1 uh, from the right, 
is negative infinity and the limit as x approaches negative one from the left is positive infinity. Um, so recall that that was the definition of a vertical asymptote. It's a line uh, or a value of x uh, for which you have a positive or negative infinite limit uh, for where your left or right hand limits as you're approaching that number. Um, so here are vertical asymptotes are the lines x equals positive or negative one. Uh, to find horizontal asymptotes, uh, we consider the limit of our function as x approaches positive or negative infinity. Uh, now here, regardless of whether we approach positive or negative infinity, we would have a limiting value of one. Uh, so recall from our chapter 11 material, if you're taking the infinite limit of a rational function, uh, you ask yourself where the highest power of x is. And here, if we have the same highest power of x in the numerator and denominator, uh, our limiting value would be the ratio of these lead coefficients. One x squared over one x squared uh, would give us a value of one. Um, so here, our horizontal asymptote uh, would be the line y equals one. All right. Um, so now, uh, the rest of our procedure is the same as what we've been doing. Uh, in part B, we're asked to find the intervals on which f is increasing or decreasing and identify the local extrema. Uh, so we start by looking for our derivative. So here, f prime of x, uh, we're going to make use of the quotient rule to find our derivative. Uh, so the quotient rule says we differentiate the numerator. So here we would have 2x, then we multiply by the denominator, x squared minus 1. Then we subtract the numerator, which was x squared, uh, times the derivative of the denominator, um, which is 2x. And then the entire expression is divided by the denominator squared. Uh, so simplifying uh, by expanding and grouping like terms, well, we would have a 2x times x squared is 2x cubed but then we're subtracting an x squared times 2x, so we're subtracting 2x cubed. Uh, so the only term that we're left with is then our 2x times this negative one, uh, which leaves us with a numerator of negative 2x divided by our denominator. Um, so to find critical values, we're looking for values of x uh, such that uh, this derivative is undefined uh, now we see that it's undefined if x is positive or negative one, um, but those aren't critical values because our function wasn't defined at positive or negative one. Recall those were asymptotes. Um, so the only critical values which we could have uh, would be if this derivative is equal to zero, uh, which means that our numerator, negative two x, would have to equal zero. Uh, so we find that x would have to equal zero. Um, so let's look at our intervals of increase or decrease. So here we're thinking about the domain of our function, which would be all real numbers except negative one and positive one, where we had those asymptotes. And then we had a critical value of x equals zero. So uh, we need to determine the sign of the derivative on each of these subintervals. So moving from left to right, uh, to the left of negative one, I could take x equals negative two. And I'm looking for the sign of the first derivative. Now, notice for our first derivative, uh, the denominator is this expression squared, which is always positive. So really the sign of our derivative is only determined by the numerator, negative two x. So if we take x as negative two, we would have a positive value for our first derivative. Uh, between negative one and zero, we could take negative one half. Uh, so multiplying by negative two, we have a positive one, it's still increasing. Uh, then between zero and one, we could take one half, 
So our numerator would be negative 1. That means our function's now decreasing. And to the right of 1, we could take x equals 2. Uh, substituting into the derivative, we would have a numerator which is negative. So still decreasing there. So to summarize our results, we can say this function would be increasing on the intervals uh, from negative infinity to negative 1 or from negative 1 to 0 and is decreasing on the intervals from uh, 0 to 1 and from 1 to infinity. Um, so we have our intervals of increase or decrease. Uh, now we were also asked to identify the local extrema in this part. Um, so we see from our work already uh, that our function was changing from increasing to decreasing at x equals 0, uh, which means that it has a local uh, maximum at x equals 0 by the first derivative test. Uh, now, to get the y value for this point, we would take x equals 0 and substitute back into the original function, uh, which would give us 0 over negative 1, uh, which is 0. Um, now, there was no point for, uh, or no value of x <coughs> for which we were changing from uh, decreasing to increasing. So a local minimum... Uh, does not exist. All right. Now, in part C, uh, we're asked about the intervals of concavity. Uh, so we need to look at our second derivative. Uh, so recall from part B, the first derivative, f prime of x, uh, was given by negative 2x over um, x squared minus 1 quantity squared. Um, so let's take a look at our um, second derivative. So there's a few ways we could differentiate. We could use the quotient rule and chain rule. Um, if you prefer, you could rewrite this as negative 2x times x squared minus 1 to the negative 2, and then use the product rule and chain rule. Um, but neither approach is uh, particularly easy. Um, so I'm going to stick with the quotient rule here. Uh, so my second derivative, f double prime of x, would be found by taking the derivative of the numerator, so that is negative 2, times the denominator, x squared minus 1 squared. Then we would subtract the numerator, so subtracting a negative 2x, we would have positive 2x times the derivative of the denominator. So using the um, chain rule to take the derivative of the denominator, we have 2 times x squared minus 1 to the first times the derivative of the inside function, which would be 2x, and the whole thing is then divided by the denominator squared. So squaring x squared minus 1 squared, we would have x squared minus 1 then to the fourth power. Okay. Uh, now if we expand and simplify a little bit, uh, we are left with a value of 6x plus uh, 6x squared plus 2 uh, all over x squared minus 1 to the third power. Okay, um, so notice that your numerator, both terms involve a factor of x squared minus 1 to the first, uh, so you can factor that out from each term in the numerator cancel one power of x squared minus 1 in the denominator, uh, which gives you that x squared minus 1 cubed, and then uh, expanding the rest of your numerator and simplifying, you're left with 6x squared plus 2. Um, so we see that uh, 
uh, or we're looking for values of x that would make this second derivative undefined or zero. Now our numerator, 6x squared plus 2, is always positive. Um, so there are no values for which the second derivative is zero. Uh, and we see that the second derivative is undefined at x equals positive or negative 1. Um, but so was our original function. Recall those were the asymptotes. Um, so let's think about the sign of this second derivative uh, over the domain of our function. So here, the domain is again all real numbers except positive or negative 1 where we had those asymptotes. Um, so to determine the sign of our second derivative on each of these intervals, we can choose test values. Uh, so say to the left of negative 1, we could take negative 2 uh, and our numerator, we mentioned, is always positive, so we really only care about the sign of the denominator. Um, so taking x equals negative 2, uh, for our denominator, we would have 4 minus 1, uh, which is 3, and then cubed, uh, which is positive. So our function will be concave upward on this interval. Uh, between positive and negative 1, we could take x equals 0. Uh, and then our denominator would be negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1, so it's concave downward. And then to the right of 1, we could take x equals positive 2, and again we see our denominator would be positive, so the second derivative is positive. Uh, so summarizing our results, uh, we could say that the graph of our function is concave upward, on the intervals negative infinity to negative 1, or from 1 to infinity, and is concave downward on the interval from negative 1 to positive 1. Uh, then for our inflection points, Well, we change the direction of concavity at x equals positive or negative 1. However, those points were asymptotes on uh, the graph of our function. Um, so that is, our function is undefined at x equals positive or negative 1. Uh, so there are no inflection points. We would say they do not exist. We only change concavity at the asymptotes here. Um, so finally, in part D, uh, we're asked to sketch the graph of our function uh, using the indicated information. So here uh, in our xy plane, let's make a rough sketch, which we can then double check using software. Uh, so again, I would start uh, by maybe plotting my asymptotes. Um, so in our previous examples, we didn't have asymptotes for uh, our function. But in this example, we saw that we had vertical asymptotes at x equals positive 1. Uh, and at x equals negative 1. Uh, and then we had a horizontal asymptote at uh, x equals 1, uh, or y equals 1. So a horizontal line passing through y equals 1. Uh, now, we could also plot our um, local extrema, uh, or intercepts. So here, um, our original function, um, let's take a look at it. Um, so it <coughs> uh, doesn't have x-intercepts um, other than the corresponding y-intercept of 0. Uh, so the only value for which our function can be 0 is 0 itself, which was also a, a local maximum. Uh, now, let's use the information that we found in our previous parts to sketch our curve. So we uh, saw that as x was approaching positive or negative infinity, we were approaching this uh, asymptote of y equals 1. And then from negative infinity uh, to negative 1, our function was increasing in concave upward. And the left-hand limit, as x was approaching uh, negative 1 from the left, was positive infinity. 
So we have a curve which is increasing and concave upward. And as we're approaching negative one from the left, our function approaches positive infinity. Uh, similarly, as x was approaching negative infinity, uh, our curve was approaching this horizontal asymptote of one. So it looks something like this. Uh, now on the interval from negative one to zero, our function was still increasing, but was then concave downward. And we saw the right hand limit as x was approaching negative one was negative infinity. So I have values which were decreasing to negative infinity as we approach negative one from the right. And then my function is increasing and concave downward on this interval. Uh, passing through this point zero, zero, which was our local maximum. And then on the interval from zero to one, our function was uh, decreasing, still concave downward. And as x approached positive one from the left, we said our function was approaching negative infinity. It looks something like this. <clears throat> Now, uh, <clears throat> the right-hand limit as x approaches positive one from the right was positive infinity. So we have a function which was blowing up. And then uh, as x approaches positive infinity, we said we approached the asymptote y equals one, and our function was decreasing and concave upward on that interval. So we have something that looks like the following. All right, um, so rough sketch for the graph of our function. Uh, let's double check what this looks like using our graphing software. Um, so here, our function was x squared, uh, which was then being divided by uh, x squared minus one. Um, so here we have uh, the graph of our function shown and uh, it seems to mirror uh, what we had sketched by hand, but of course a little uh, more precise than we could uh, generate by hand. So let's look at one last example, uh, another example with a rational function. Um, so again, a quotient of two polynomials. Uh, so when we're working with rational functions, the first thing that we might check is uh, <coughs> um, for asymptotes. Uh, so we're asked to find vertical or horizontal asymptotes. Uh, starting with vertical asymptotes, uh, we ask ourselves where the denominator would be zero, uh, which of course in this case is x equals zero. Um, so we have a vertical asymptote of x equal to zero. Uh, and we can verify that if we were to consider limits. The limit as x approaches zero uh, from the left of x squared plus four over x uh, would be negative infinity. And as x approaches zero from the right, our function approaches positive infinity. So we had a vertical asymptote of x equals zero. Uh, now to find horizontal asymptotes, we would look at the limit of our function as x approaches positive or negative infinity. Um, so here as x approaches positive infinity, x squared plus four over x would approach positive infinity. Uh, because we're looking at an infinite limit of a rational function where the highest power of x is in the numerator. So recall from our chapter 11 work, if the highest power is in the numerator, uh, then as x becomes large, uh, the numerator is growing more rapidly than the denominator, so that ratio is becoming infinitely large. Uh, and here, positive, because if x is positive, we see the numerator and denominator are both positive. Now, as x approaches negative infinity, this function approaches negative infinity. Again, the, the numerator is larger than the denominator. Uh, but now if x is negative, our numerator is positive, but the denominator is negative. So hence uh, the sign negative infinity in this case.
Um, so since there is no number which uh, the values of our function are approaching as x becomes uh, larger in the positive or negative direction uh, for horizontal asymptotes, uh, we would say there are none. They do not exist. Uh, now in part b, we're asked to find the intervals on which our function is increasing or decreasing and identify the local extrema. Um, so as with our earlier examples, we start by finding the critical values of our function. So here differentiating using the quotient rule, uh, we would have uh, the derivative of our numerator is 2x uh, times the denominator x. Then we subtract the numerator, which was x squared plus 4, times the derivative of the denominator, which would be 1. And then the whole thing is divided by our denominator x squared. Uh, so simplifying in the numerator, we have a 2x squared, and then we're subtracting an x squared. So that leaves us with 1x squared. And then the only other term we have is uh, we're subtracting a 4, so minus 4, and then all over x squared. Uh, so we see that our second derivative is undefined at 0, or excuse me, our first derivative is undefined at 0, uh, but so was the function. Recall that was a vertical asymptote. So the only critical values we would have are values uh, for which this derivative is 0, uh, which means that our numerator, x squared minus 4, would have to be 0, and so x would have to be positive or negative 2. Uh, so looking at the domain of our function, which would be all real numbers except zero, where we had our vertical asymptote, uh, we also had critical values of negative two and positive two. So for intervals of increase or decrease, uh, we need the sign of the derivative in each subinterval. So moving from left to right, uh, starting to the left of negative two, uh, we could take x equals negative three and then we would substitute into our uh, first derivative. Now notice that the denominator of our first derivative is x squared, which is always positive. Uh, so uh, we really only care about the sign of our numerator, x squared minus 4. Uh, so if we take x as negative 3, uh, we would get a positive value, so our function would be increasing. Uh, now, between negative 2 and 0, we could choose negative 1, uh, in which case our denominator is uh, negative, our function is decreasing. Uh, then between 0 and 2, we could take 1, uh, so our numerator is then uh, negative, um, so we would still have a decreasing function. And then uh, from 2 to infinity, we could choose 3 as a test value, and we would have a positive derivative, so our function would be increasing. Uh, so, to summarize our results, we could say the function would be increasing on the intervals from negative infinity to negative 2, or from 2 to infinity, and is decreasing on the intervals from negative 2 to 0, or uh, from 0 to 2. And now we're also asked to identify any local extrema. Uh, so from our work so far, we could see the function changed from increasing to decreasing at negative 2. So the first derivative test tells us that we have a local maximum at that point. Um, so that would be uh, when x is negative 2, and substituting negative 2 into the original function, the corresponding y value is negative 4. Uh, now our function was also changing from decreasing to increasing at x equals 2. So we have a local minimum at x equals 2. Uh, and the corresponding y value we find by substituting into the original function, and we have a value of 4.
Uh, so again, in our next part, we're going to find the intervals of concavity. Uh, so recall that our function, uh, or the derivative of our function from the previous part, uh, was x squared minus 4 divided by x squared. Uh, or, uh, to make this a little easier, if we split the fraction, uh, x squared divided by x squared is 1, and then we've got minus 4 over x squared. Um, so, finding our second derivative, either using the quotient rule or the simplified expression for uh, f prime, so that is 1 minus 4x to the uh, negative second power, uh, we have a second derivative of positive 8x to the negative third, uh, which is 8 over x cubed. Um, so either using the quotient rule or the simplified expression, we'll end up with the same uh, value for our second derivative. And we see that the second derivative uh, is never equal to 0, since our numerator is never 0. Uh, and it's undefined at x equals 0, which was our vertical asymptote. Uh, so here, the domain of our function was all real numbers except 0, where we had our asymptote. Uh, so to determine concavity, we would choose test values in each subinterval and look at the sign of the second derivative. Uh, so to the left of 0, we could choose x equals negative 1, Substituting into the second derivative, we would have negative 8. So this is decreasing. Uh, to the right of 0, we could choose positive 1, in which case we have a positive 8. Uh, so our function would be concave upward on that interval. So summarizing our results, we could say the function is concave upward on the interval from 0 to infinity and is concave downward on the interval from negative infinity to zero. Uh, then we were asked about inflection points. So here, uh, the only point where we change concavity was at x equals zero. Uh, but remember, there is no point on the curve for x equals zero. That was a vertical asymptote for our function. Um, so we would say that there is no inflection point here or they do not exist. Uh, so in the last part, we're ready to sketch the graph of our function. Um, so here in the xy plane, uh, we had a vertical asymptote of x equals 0. Um, so that is the y-axis itself. Um, <coughs> and uh, then we had local extrema at negative 2, negative 4. So a point here. And we had a local um, minimum at 2, 4. So here. All right. Um, now, uh, let's see if we can sketch our curve. So uh, we saw that our function was increasing on the interval from negative infinity to negative 2, uh, and it was concave downward. So we have some curve which is increasing, concave downward. Uh, so it looks like this, and we hit our local maximum at negative 2, negative 4. Uh, and then our function changes to decreasing, but still concave downward. And as we were approaching x equals 0 from the left, uh, we said our function was approaching negative infinity. We had this vertical asymptote there. Um, so we have a function that looks something like this. Uh, and then on the right of our asymptote, as we were approaching 0 from the right-hand side, we said... Uh, the function was approaching positive infinity, so it's increasing without bound. Um, now, from uh, 0 uh, to x equals 2, our function was decreasing and concave upward. So it looks something like this. 
uh, and then from two to infinity, our function changed to increasing and still concave upward. So it looks something like this. All right. Um, so let's see if we can uh, verify this result by looking at some software. Um, so let's see, what was our original function that we're plotting? Uh, x squared plus 4 over x squared. All right. Um, so using our graphing utility, let's see what we have. So our numerator, we'll put in parentheses, uh, was x squared plus 4. And then that entire expression was being divided by x squared. Um, uh, or by just x itself. Um, so we have... Oh, let me omit that power. There we go. Um, so, zooming out a little bit, we see uh, we do indeed have... Uh, the local maxima and minima that we found, uh, the intervals of increase and decrease in concavity. Uh, so it looks uh, pretty similar to what we sketched by hand, but of course more precise than we could uh, sketch by hand. And this last example uh, illustrates uh, a type of asymptote, uh, which is referred to as a slant or sometimes oblique asymptote, um, uh, which isn't discussed in uh, your textbook very much, but just to give you a quick idea of what uh, a slant asymptote is, uh, these arrive, uh, arise uh, in rational functions where the degree of the numerator is one higher than the denominator. Um, so if we were to split this fraction as x squared over x and 4 over x, uh, we're left with x plus 4 over x. And as values of x approach positive or negative infinity, this 4 over x term would tend to 0. So for large values of x, that is as x approaches positive or negative infinity, uh, we expect the function f of x to behave like this first term because the second term uh, becomes smaller and smaller. It's approaching 0. Um, so let's look at the graph of y equals x along with the graph of our function. So recall the graph of y e equals x would be uh, the graph of a line of slope 1 passing through the origin. Um, so here uh, we can see from our rough sketch that as x approaches positive or negative infinity, uh, the graph of our function seems to be approaching that line. Um, so this concept, again, is called a, a slant or an oblique asymptote, um, which you won't be tested on in this course, but I encourage you, if you're interested, uh, to read up on oblique or slant asymptotes um, or search uh, for some videos online, and there will be some nice examples to illustrate these concepts.